a first gen series and we are very very pleased today to have with us professor donna hope who is going to share with us some of her life stories things that she's gone through in life and hopefully the objective is that it will inspire each and every one of us listening and so right now let us welcome professor Donna Hope, she's a professor of culture, gender, and society in the Institute of Caribbean Studies. She's a former deputy dean of graduate studies and research in the Faculty of Humanities and Education here at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. She's done a whole lot of research. She's an author. And one of the books that we're going to talk about a lot today is the book entitled Chicken Back Gravy and Such Delights. Absolutely fascinating book, Life Lessons from Her Journey. And she wrote this book in 2019. She's a well-known media communicator. She communicates on cultural, social, political issues. And she is actually also a former director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies. Uh, so she does a lot of research in the area of popular culture and music, dance hall culture, youth development, Black masculinities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So she is, as we all recognize, she is not a scientist, but we won't hold that against her. She is well accomplished in her field. And as I said, she is here to, to inspire us and to help us to, to see that, you know, you can make it through. You can make it through no matter what it is your station in life is you can get there. So let us welcome Professor Donna Hope. Hi everyone. I'm, I'm sure my camera is open. Hi everyone. I, I'm not sure if I'm being seen, um, but I hope everyone can see and hear me from my end. I can't see everything, but hi everyone. Um, Good evening, and I'm not sure who I'm speaking to, how many students I'm speaking to, but I'm really pleased to be able to share with you this evening a little bit about myself um, and about my journey. Um, of course, I am a two-time graduate of the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, um, though I'm not a scientist. I think in an earlier life, I planned to be a medical doctor, but it didn't really work out that way. So I may have been doing something a little scientific, but then I ended up doing something very different. Um, and so um, as a part of your the first year experience and this first gen series, I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself. Um, and and of course, um, I have a little presentation, so I may show a little piece of it. And I talk mainly around this book. Um, this is my chicken back gravy and such delights. It's a very small book, not a lot of reading, only 98 pages. It has eight life lessons in it, which came, came out of my own experience as a Jamaican coming from the working classes. I'm from St. Catherine, Linton St. Catherine, originally born and grow. And one of the things that is also important about my journey is that I am a high school dropout. So I dropped out of high school very early um, at the end of fourth form, did not graduate. I got pregnant. And so all of my life journey um, becomes colored by two things, my family's own situation economically. I come from a very poor family. And then, of course, putting to, to that poverty, dropping out of high school made things very, very difficult. Nonetheless, there's a journey that occurs and I cross over many barriers and end up being a full professor at Middle Way Mona after going through you know, all the journeys of getting a first degree, a, a master's, and then traveling abroad on a Fulbright scholarship to get a so it's a lot of journeying inside of the journeys. And so I share a little bit about um, my journey. So one of the things that is important, and I'm going to share my screen. Let me see if I can um, share my screen. Uh, uh, two monitors, which I did not set up my monitors. Um, let me see. And I'm, I'm going to share. Why? Because I have an extra monitor, which I did not set the top application window here. So I'm sharing my screen. And so this arm here is a little bit of my story. Um, um, checking that gravy and such delights, and this is a piece of my story. So what the book cover looks like. Um, it's a van we call it in, in academia vanity publishing. So it's a, that's my picture on it. I like that picture, and it was taken with a good Samsung phone. Um, in the studios of TBJ, I went to do a shoot of ER, which I do a lot of talking about dancehall culture. 
and and those kinds of activities. So one of the things that my life is number one in that book, I talk about asking you who you are, who am I? And why do I ask that question? Because one of the things that I've found out along my own journey as a university student, for example, as a woman trying to cross over young woman and carrying my own burdens and being economically challenged was that I had to locate myself. Who am I? What is my basket with the water I'm carrying? What are the burdens that I'm carrying? What are the benefits that I'm carrying? What are the things that make me who I am? And so I had to think about that and talk to myself about it because everybody, everybody listening to this presentation, everybody, adults, young adults, older adults, we are all human beings. We are equal, but we are also different. We have our own realities. We have our own problems. We have our own things that are good about us. We have our own positives, everything that goes with it. And I had to ask myself, who am I? Two of the most powerful words that you will ever ask yourself, because what comes after them, what your answer is going to be, that is going to shape your reality. So at the start of my journey, when I came to the University of the West Indies, I came as a part, I had to try to start part-time because I had to work full-time. I am a responsible parent. I had a child. I was also the main breadwinner for my family at that time. And so I had to work. I was working. I had part-time students. I tried to compensate them. And I'm hearing a feedback. And I'm hearing a Professor, yes, yes. I um, I'm actually not yes, yes. seeing you on the screen. Are you seeing anything at Is all? Is your camera I'm off? Sharing. Off? I no. don't see anything at all. I'm well, I know I'm not. I'm not seeing well, anything on the screen for me either. What time? I'm not seeing on the screen for me either. What time? I'm not here. I'm hearing you clearly. Um, everything is on. Um, everything is on. Yes. Okay. I clicked all the buttons. And everything is on, so I'm not sure what's happening. And everything is on, so I'm not sure what's happening. And I'm seeing a screen with my name on it, but there's nothing. The screen is blank. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. I'm not hearing you now. I think have you muted your microphone because I'm not hearing anything now. And let me probably actually connect my second screen and see if it might help. Because I actually use two screens here, but it doesn't normally work with some of these um uh studios. So I disconnected it. Let me see what happened with my let second screen. What happened with my second screen. Um it's powering up. Um, it's powering up. Mm -hmm. We didn't get to do the test. We didn't get to do the tests. True. My second screen is up, but this my is not going up. Is up but this is not going up. This particular, this particular, going across the second. Going across the second. So, I have. A, I can see two um portals on my computer. I can't see myself. I can myself. Hmm, I'm not sure. This is my camera. This is my camera. This is my camera. So, okay, let me let me stop. Okay, now I let me. Okay, I think I know. I found what was happening here. Can you see me now? Oh, I. Oh, I, yes, I can see me now. So we can see me now. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, beautiful. I apologize to the audience. Um, I have I normally yes, I use a camera. Me now, so we can see me now. Oh, I so apologize to the audience. Let me continue. Um, I was talking about my book and, and showing a little bit of my presentation. Yes, I'm going to talk about my book and showing a little bit of my presentation. So I'm going to that. And um, just to go back to what I had shown um, on the screen at the beginning, and because I was to go back to what I had shown um, on the screen at the beginning. Right. So now I can see two screens. So this, so in a real sense, this is my. Um, are you hearing me? Okay. Are you seeing me? Okay. Hello. No, we are not. So I'll remove the screen. Are you hearing me? Okay, and seeing me? Okay. Yes, I'm assuming we are. So I will continue the presentation. So as I said, um, 
the um, life lessons, number one, know yourself. Who am I? And as I said, I asked myself that question quite a lot because of the way my journey was going and the kind of life I had to live. So many of our students will talk about the challenges they have, for example, to pay their school fees. In my book, Chicken Back Gravy and Social Lives, I talk a lot about how I pay my way to university. For my first degree, I used my student's loan. So the student's loan bro, was very important um, as a part of my own journey. And it's referenced throughout the book quite a lot because it was very important. Because coming from a background where things were difficult and hard, even though I was working and I was a young adult, I didn't get to come to the right out of high school, as you understand. And so I had to decide on how to pay for my university. And I had to decide on that pretty early because I wanted a degree and I realized that having a first degree, whether it's in the sciences, which I had planned to come to, whether it was in the social sciences was also what I had planned to come to, but where I ended up was in the faculty at that time called Arts and General Studies. It was abs. I always call it Faculty of Humanities and Education. So I ended up at the Faculty of Humanities and Education and I did a first degree in mass communication. That's what it was called at that time. It was a very interesting journey for me because Coming from a situation where, and I, my life lesson number four, poverty is not a nice thing. Coming out of a situation where poverty is a reality, something that we face, something that we have to deal with every day. Um, and the book, the title of my book, Chicken Bag Gravy and Such Delights. Uh, my apologies. It's a very loud meeting. And so my the top title of my book, Chicken Bag Gravy and Such Delights, really references and talks really to poverty. People come from poor situations for watching that really is people who don't will have heard about chicken back and probably see being used in other ways to feed your pets maybe um fry up and dirty girl dirty girl a synonym for chicken for tin mackerel but the kind of thing dumping and butter fish back the kind of things that people who go to poor situations have to deal with and the way that it impacts on you as a part of my journey at UA, i had to be very careful about how i manage my resources i started university part-time I came to you part-time for two years because I had to work. I had to work. And at that time, the kind of options that students now have of working in the um, BPO, the, 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 the telemarketing, that kind of thing where you can, you know, work on the system during different hours and still get to come to classes and earn enough to cover your bills and to buy your food. We didn't have those options back then. I'm talking about, of course, I came to university in the early 90s as an undergraduate student. So things are very different now. Transportation options were also different. We did not have the kind of transportation options. They were far more limited. So you had to decide how you're making your way on campus, how you're going to get off, how you're going to get home. I lived in Linstead. I had a lot of stories of getting stranded at night in Spanish Town because the barge is blocked because it's rained and you have to figure it out getting home at midnight so we have i have a lot of these stories but one thing that i re recognize for me it was very important was that and i'm not going to talk about the father of the story was that as someone coming from a backbone that is poor you have to work a little harder labor on your wing if labor conquers all the latin and you guys who are going to in the sciences are going to have, have already started dealing with a lot of latin phrases and latin terminologies that was the motto of my high school, is the motto of my high school, St. Diego. I had big up yourself. Um, and so I hard work not kill you. Pressure on a book. Those are some of the things that I kept in the back of my head um, as a part of my journey at the University of the West Indies on a campus. Um, and also being very focused there. Eh? One, one of the things that was critical for me and along my journey was the idea that I've always held in my head. My mother taught me this from an early age, God rest her soul. Education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. Nelson Mandela is saying, you have to dream big, you have to dream massive, you have to dream very large. One of my sayings, education travels well, renews itself and appreciates with age. The University of the West Indies Mona, where you are placed, and the University of the West Indies regionally, of which are a part, very important in the region as well as globally. It's a first class university and a degree from the University of the West Indies. Mona campus, Cadill campus, St. Augustine campus, Oak campus is one that can take you across the world, travels well, renews itself, appreciates with age, and it gives you better options in life so that we understand the value of it. Understanding, of course, as Vibes Cartel um, says, and Cartel is one of the um, artists whose work I look at in my own work on Jamaican dance hall. Every get a youth is a star and you're unstoppable. People have dreams and coming to the University of West Indies. For me, 
as an undergraduate student was really about fulfilling some of the dreams I had as a child. Coming from the country, being a, from a poor background, they say you're bright, and they tell all of us from early on, you I'm going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer. Those are the dreams of many working class individuals, and even individuals, some of them. And the doctor is, as I said, I always said, is a medical doctor. And so I believe that I would be a medical doctor. And I was at high school going through the ropes to be a medical doctor up until the time I dropped out at the end of fourth form. So I did chemistry, I did biology, I did physics, I did admats, I did all of those subjects because I was on my way to becoming a medical doctor. I was getting prepped to go on the um, school challenge with Steve for St. Jacob High School, started prepping people from fourth form. Um, and then I dropped out of high school and pregnant and all of those things were put on the back burner. But one of the things that I always recognize, and that's my dog. Um, okay, yes, so that's my dog. Um, one of the things that we recognize is that um, you have to be unstoppable as someone who is, whether you're a ghetto youth, you're a Jamaican youth, you're a poor youth, you're not support youth, you have your family support, you don't have the kind of family support that some people have. You're taking students' loan, your family putting together the money, your parents have money put aside for you, you have a trust fund, whatever it is, you know. You have to be unstoppable when you're heading towards your dreams. Dreaming big, dreaming massive, dreaming huge. And in this instance, one of your key dreams is really to, to get your education together and getting it of course and through the university of west indies mona which is my home and is the place where i decided at the end of all my studies to continue working and so i was very unstoppable and i want to pay my little thing i have to pay admitting i have to pay admitting some music for the students In my prayer for me fall like rain. Some have a dream and a night dream. Every day it can be the same. For the sky like rain. Pray for me fall like rain. For me a little good. Tell myself we have a plan. And it goes on. The journey did long. Ah, I need to say that last part. Where we are come from, I love coming in for dinner, and I and I and I pause it there because of course the journey from chicken back gravy to being able to have options for your dinner is something that people like myself, even as a full professor at the University of West Indies now, understands that long journey and the way that education and I keep the slide up for a bit because education is a critical part of the journey has proven invaluable. Let me say this, education for me has proven invaluable along my life's journey, which is one of the reasons why I continue to write, I continue to work, and I continue to share with students. So when Dr. Gallimore contacted me, I'm on sabbatical for this year, writing a book. I have a cartel collection finishing. I have a book on masculinities. I'm working on a book, dance or scattered collection. I'm putting out another version of Chicken Back Gravy. I'm doing a lot of writing and some research but I always want to share with the students to answer questions where possible and to also encourage and mentor students along the way because regardless of the kind of economic situation you come from, whether you come from uptown, downtown, out of town, round town, our students have a lot of issues that they are trying to work through as a part of this journey. And first year students come, I know a lot of you, with a lot of questions that you want answered. How do you do this? How do you keep yourself at the forefront? How do you keep your dreams at the top of the agenda? And how do you keep them carrying you to the place where you want to end up? Graduation, straight A's. At the end of my first degree journey, after struggling quite a lot, coming on full-time after the second year of, of part-time. So it took me four years to do the first degree, two years full-time, two years part-time. Um, struggling very hard, having a lot of difficulties financially. Um, going abroad, yes, I did one summer abroad, working abroad um, to work one summer, coming back, getting mainly straight A's um, and ending up with a first class on its first degree after whole heap of challenges and still keeping my son in school. My son is also a graduate of this university. Um, and so, um, and, uh, along that journey, one of the things that I learned was that the University of the West Indies provides you with a lot of opportunities to also carry you through 
I read every notice board, I followed up with scholarships and grants, and I made sure that I networked quite significantly using every opportunity that was there so that I could then achieve my goals and move on to the next level um, as a part of my journey as an undergraduate. And I also did a master's of philosophy and political science in the Department of Government at UA. I was granted a scholarship to do that. And at the end of that, I taught in that department for six years as a as teaching assistant, adjunct, and, and, and working in different capacities. Then I was um, given a Fulbright scholarship to do my PhD abroad. Remember, I came in as an adult student because I had my high school years were cut short. So I came in and I had to catch up. So all of my, my cohort was already eight years ahead of me. When I came on campus, the people that I was spending a lot of time with in my classes were eight years younger than I am because my cohort had already gone. So I was kind of behind the curveball. So I had to do a lot of running to catch up and pass out some of these people that um, I had been in school with. It's been a wonderful journey. And one of the things I tell people, hold on to your dreams and remember that you still have to do the work still have to put in the world, even in this COVID-19 timeline, that is very challenging for many of us. Um, um, it's very important that we put in a lot of the work that is important so that we are able in a real sense to continue to achieve our dreams, keeping in touch with the people that we are in touch with. Um, let me share the last slide. With, I think this is all, this slide has all my contact information. I'm on Facebook. Instagram on my Facebook is full. Chicken that gravy is also on Instagram, so you can follow us. Um, and I also have a, a have a, I do work on another um entity called the Dance Hall Archive and Research Initiative. We work on Dance Hall, and we're trying to put out some works, um, collaborating with some people in Mexico and elsewhere. But of course, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen, so I need to put my face back up here, <laughs> right? And so, as a part of my own journey and the work that I've done, my own life's work. I consider my the University of the West Indies, the Mona campus in particular, but the regional body to be a very important location to achieving your dreams. And the first degree is the first step. Um, you are um, coming in, you are the 2020, 2021 um, group coming in. The first degree is the first step on what can be a wonderful journey, a very empowering journey, a very enlightening journey, and a journey that can achieve many goals along the way. And position where you can be all that you want to be so welcome i'm grateful to be sharing with you and if there are any questions i'm not sure how i'll be able to get them from the youtube but um thank you so much and let me know if you have any questions and remember from chicken back gravy from poverty to professor it's a big jump a huge dream and i remain forever grateful to the campus and the university of the west Indies. thank you Questions? Am I able to take questions or do I?
Okay, so I'm looking at the questions. I see questions um, in the box. I hope you're hearing me and there's a bike passing. I didn't breathe. They were close to the road. Why did I make it and others did not? Um, well, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about why I made it as a teenage dropout from high school because um, I think one of the things that I'm going to say is that my mother was a very determined woman and she was extremely supportive. We were poor, but she was, she was a dreamer. And so she kept on putting in my head the things that I could become and hope, you know, what she would want me to achieve and things that she would have wanted to achieve if she, her life had been different. She was a poor woman from rural St. Catherine and her destiny was to become a farmer's wife. So she ran away from country at 16 and did not go back. <laughs> she always told me that story. So I think um, I was, my head was full of dreams and I'm not talking about the one that just sleep and don't wake. I'm talking about the waking dream. I wanted to achieve. I was a very bright child. I actually got a government scholarship from high school, from um, primary school to go to high school. So I knew that I was a brilliant child and that I could achieve. And I was, let me tell you, I was very determined because in my book, In Chicken Back Gravy and Such a Life, one of the chapters is called Poverty is not a nice thing. Life is number four. I hated poverty. It was not something I wanted to live in. What prompted me to, to write this motivational book? Really, at this point in my life, and this book I wrote it in 2019, it's self-published. And at this point in my life, one of the things that I try to do is to give back and to share a lot about myself. I've not been, I talk a lot about dance hall and the culture and all of that. But I wanted to share something about myself and my journey because I feel, especially reading in the Star and the Green and online, many people are searching for answers. Young people want to know how to make it big. Let me, let me tell you guys. It takes 20 years to become an overnight success. So all the overnight success stories you see floating around, remember you have to put in a lot of work on the back end to get to that level. So it takes some amount of work and you have to put in time to get to there. And I wanted to put that in my book as well so people would understand that when you see someone moving through life, they didn't just wake up big right there. So I wanted to give that information up there so people would have it packaged not everyone has the opportunity to have me in a presentation format. And I find that having a love of books from early, that books tend to outlast the lifetime of the person whose um, ideas are captured in. How critical is the power of association? And when you talk about the power of association, um, which association are you talking about? Association with ideas, association with people, I'm not sure. Um, but the power of association for me, I'm thinking of the way that you would associate your own self and your own life with ideas that are important to you and with dreams that are critical to you, very critical. It is important for you to surround yourself with people, surround yourself with ideas, surround yourself with entity, um, entities that are important to how you want to move through life. And so um, it is very important that you identify what will be important to you in life and try to associate with them. It means, of course, that sometimes you're going to have to change your, 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 your own group as you go along or your group will morph and change as you go along. Very critical. Um, you speak about the importance of entrepreneurship. Do you think that is stressing enough at you? The University of the West Indies, you know, has been pushing for the last five or more years on, on, on entrepreneurship as important. For example, in the sciences, a lot of entrepreneurship is going on. Um, the university, for example, at research days, we didn't have one this year. But at our research days, we stress the idea of being able to transform your work into products, goods, or services that can bring back resources we stressing that a lot. Students have to listen and listen within the timelines. I'm in the Institute of Caribbean Studies. One of our flagship programs is the um, ESEM program, eh? and that is the cultural, the enter, the enter, the um, cultural, the, the, the ESEM program, which is the enter, enter, entertainment and cultural enterprise management program. And so we're talking about managing cultural entities cultural individuals, creative actors, and it provides students that wealth of importance. I've had students on the sciences from your faculty come across on the courses because of the ECM program and in the ICS because of the importance, for example, of culture to our lives broader. So I'm inviting some of you guys over there to do a free lecture to get the chance. We love having you over there because it's wonderful to see the scientists balancing as well with the culture, which they are all a part of. So entrepreneurship is very critical and the university has been stressing it. Dr. Kadam tonight, I know I set up the Entrepreneurship Center. 
which also provides a lot of information and um, courses that you can participate in as well to help you set out. And of course, over by the Mona School of Business and Management, you can also get. So again, electives are important. You can get yourselves attached to courses that will help to build out the overall focus of your first degree. Um, but it's very, all of these things, eh? What types of philanthropic activities are you a part of? Well, I engage in a lot of philanthropic activities, but most of them I don't publicize them. So I work with parents, teenage girls, many parents, and I work with both the girls and their parents because it's a joint activity. Um, to sort of encourage them to see that there is life beyond teenage pregnancy. They have very traumatic experience for families when their daughters turn up pregnant. So I work with those families. I do work with the Ministry of Culture, um, again, working with women. I also work with, um, I do work behind the scenes also with my alma mater, St. Diego High, very connected to St. Diego High, assisting in various ways and, and you know, giving um, contributions for students helping with books and all of that. I help different people, families every year at about this time when school is just starting um, with books. I do several book lists for back to school as a part of that kind of activity. And I always, of course, make myself available to speak with young people. There's an entity in, in my community in Linfield, uh, Mommy and Me, which deals with young mothers. I work with that entity as well to talk to the girls, to bring resources to them connection so there are a lot of different things that i try to do um what are the main challenges you face with first gen students um and one of well, one of the challenges that i faced as the first person in my family to go to a university was uh, you have to build your own roadmap so for example in my group of friends um to get students loan and, and student spaces right now you need guarantors <laughs> I didn't have anybody in my immediate family who could be a guarantor for me. It, they, did, they didn't exist, but to be a guarantor, you have to have a structured job with a pay slip and all of that. I had to depend on friends, and it's a good thing I had been working and meeting people and was more adult. So my students' loans were guaranteed by friends, who were, none of them were guaranteed by any family member because I had no family member who could guarantee it. My father was dead by that time, and he was an absent father. So that was a big challenge for me. Um, and just the kind of roadmap. You don't have anybody to give you any ideas as to what to expect or how to deal with issues. But I had to build my networks and my friends on campus were very helpful and different departments on campus were very helpful. I think the university can offer, offer men well, mentorship and guidance is a very important support that we can offer to students who are first-gen students. Because, if, for example, in my family now, I can support and I have supported my son and my nephew and other people who are coming through and going to university. And whether you will use it or otherwise, but the university has to offer for students who are first gen students um, mentorship and guidance from individuals who have already gone that way. Because how do you access funding? What are the types of funding available? The students don't the only option. So you make yourself, you know, prepare yourself to be able to access grants, fellowships, scholarships. Um, what what do you do if you are having a problem um, with your studies? How do you get support when you're going to Depression. There are different things that students have. The UA has support systems, but first generation students I know have a lot more that they have to work through because they don't really have anybody at home who has walked the university pathway. And so it's different, it's different for you. And so those are some of the support. And I think mentorship is very important, one of the areas that is going to be critical. <laughs> Let me tell you, when I came to UA, <laughs> Let me, let me tell you guys, I applied to do, I was going to be a doctor that didn't happen. And then I applied to do econ because I had done A-level econ. I went to Eden classes to get all my subjects. And so I had done A-level econ. And I loved econ because econ has a very social side to it. So I applied to social sciences. And uh, when I, they did not accept me because I didn't have, I don't know what I didn't have. I didn't have maths at the right grade or something. When I saw the syllabus for econ, I, I said no, because it had a lot of math in it. Econ is a very math kind of subject, as you guys would, would know. Um, so when I went to you, I was not going to come to you at all, because I was very, you know, turned off. Rejection is not a good thing. And then my colleague at work, who was a university graduate at that time, a manager, said to me, you must apply, continue go through. And so I applied to Caramac. Um, 
But when I came on campus, I was very apprehensive. I was very, I was actually quite terrified because remember, guys, I'm working. I have responsibilities for my son, my mom, my little sister. I'm, I'm running a household and I'm traveling from Linton. I was apprehensive. But one of the things that I was sure of, the most positive thought, is that getting a first degree was going to change my life and give me better options. And here I am today. So it was a good thing. Um, what did my what do you think your son learned from watching you on your journey? Well, one thing my son learned the value of education, but also the value of holding on to your dreams and really working hard. So I I would get up at 4 30 or 4 a.m. to get ready to leave Lindsay. At one point we had to start leaving at 5 30 because of the traffic. And I didn't drive, I didn't have a car, you see. I was taking public transportation or getting a ride. So I, I put a lot of time and I had to study and I had to pay bills and I had to do everything. So my son learned the power of determination and of fortitude, you know, and believing in yourself, like seriously. <laughs> there were times when all I had was just faith and my mother was very supportive. Let me tell you, that woman was, she's, my mother's dead now, 18 years, but that woman was there to support me even though she didn't have any money. Because remember, you know, let me say to you, I'm first gen student. Sometimes your family members don't have money and sometimes they may not have a university background so they don't know to tell you, you know, how to navigate Sasan to sit on like that. My friends will tell me about sitting on the big show of arts faculty. A lot of people don't have that kind of family background. But my mother tell me, you have to keep on going. So she would be there for me. She was very supportive. And I think for me, that, that is something that was a part of the family structure. So my son learned a lot about family network support but struggle and also the value of an education why did i want it to change my life and to help me to be able to help my family so um do you think that your lectures help students help our students enough and i'm going to speak for my experience and for myself because of who i am and because of the way that my journey has all these different aspects to it I look out for my students in every way. So I'll sit in a class and I can, I've been doing this for a while, guys. I mean, I was in the part of government 93 to 95. I've been teaching. Um, my, I taught my first tutorial as a third year undergraduate in 1996. So I've been at UA, right? 25 years or so. Um, but so I look out for my students and I look out for them in different ways. You can look on students and know when they're not in at all, when there's only some achievement. And about to send me to another for the whole day. You know that you can see it on their face. So we look out for students in different ways. We know when students are failing, not because of a lack of effort or a lack of brain power, because everybody who comes to you immaturely, we all naturally. So I look out for my students. We try to make sure you cross over the barrier. We take care of you. Lecturers are different people. I speak for myself and for the people that I'm close to. And my friends were also lecturers on campus, heads of departments. We look out for our students and we try to ensure that we carry across the waters while we are also managing our own burdens. We love our students. I do. What have I envisioned for myself for the future? Well, um, hmm, writing more books. Um, uh, continuing, honestly, my future is I have a dog. We heard him barking, so I've gotten into the idea with pets. So I'm spending more time giving back. One of the things that I want to do is to give back more to young people. Um, you know, working with my young people, which is why again I wrote Picking Back Gravy and Such Delight, Life Lessons on My Journey, giving back to young people, not so young people, and really just continuing to be a part of my society and of Jamaica. Not, I mean, I've always wanted to remain here, not to migrate. I studied in the U.S. I did my PhD at George Mason University of Virginia, but I wanted to come back here and to be here to be accessible, continue working with Jamaican culture and really giving back to the students at the university and the people of Jamaica in whatever ways are possible. What advice would you give to students who are not confident in their ability to obtain their degree? Let me tell you the advice I give to every student approach every piece of coursework even if it is valid at five percent as if it was a final exam give every piece of coursework your best that is how you get your degrees you are everyone in this room in this meeting matriculated to the university you have different levels of matriculate but everybody has a good brain stand on that and move forward 
treat your coursework as if it was the first, it was the was the exam. Don't shoot just for exams. If you have a course that is based on only coursework, do each piece of coursework, no matter how small the percentage. And that is how you're going to make it. Remember, Professor Donna walked into you here. She was working full time. She didn't want a car. She lived in Linston. That is when before we have told what you have to drive long, take bus. She had a son that she was responsible for. She had to take care of her family. She had to work. I was a bright person, but I was carrying a whole train load, tractor load on my back. I, my confidence level was not very high. But you have to believe in your own abilities and you have to breathe like this. You have to dream it, sleep it, live it, write it down on a piece of paper. They talk about vision board. In this book, I talk about what I used to use as my vision board. Before the vision board argument came up, I used to write things down, write things down on a little book, write things on a piece of paper and achieve them. And even now, I still do that. I have a weekly and a monthly thing. I use a diary, a paper diary. And I mark off the things and I have a thing on my computer. It's a month. And I, so you have to build your vision board and keep focus. Put on your blinkers. Don't follow social. Let me say, social media is not necessarily always your friend. Half of what is on it is not true. What the other quarter, the other 25% is added to, and maybe a quarter of or less is true. Keep your focus. You will get to the end of it. Focus on it and approach every single piece of coursework as it was a final exam. Give it your all. You will be, you will succeed and keep close to your lecturers. Make sure you keep close to your lecturers. Aye. How important is it to know yourself? And that comes out, as I said in this book, who am I, the first chapter? Know yourself. First chapter, who am I? Know yourself. It is very important to understand who you are. In your university journey, in your life journey. Why? We are not plastic people, even though there are a lot of plastic bodies on this day you now. We are actually different human beings with different capacities and different opportunities and different resources. So everybody has to know themselves. You have to know. Um, as Jamil says, in one of have that song on the, on, the, on the thing. My mother and a bank teller. Some people have mothers who are in jobs that are high profile. Some people have mothers who are sell out a market. Some people have mothers who do even have a job. Um, and, and that is that that dictates a lot what is going to happen in your life. Know your family background, know the resources, know how many people have to pause in the, the home that they build in or the dream that they have for themselves as a parent to send you to. Them. And therefore, understand that your journey is special to you. It's a very beautiful journey. It's special to you. Know some people have families that are able to help them with their coursework. Some people have to be watching this thing on a phone. Some people have a tablet. Some people have three screens. It depends on your resources. Know yourself and know your capacity here. And that will help carry you through. Because you see, you will be able, once you understand who you are and where you are positioned, you can craft your own roadmap. The one that is for you. You are on campus, first generation. You are somebody who will be able to craft your own work because you build it out of your own reality, you know. Not something you see on social media, not something on their dream and pink wall and all. I see a lot of you students on their dreams. Yes. Um and so. But so and so, but that's not what your reality is yours. You know this truth of it. Know yourself. Very important. COVID-19 has impacted everybody, the university, the students, everybody. Let me, it has isolated a lot of our students because many students come to UA also for the experience of university, being there, whether you're a commuting student or you're living on hall, um, you want to, to be there to interact with people. You want to come to Professor Hope's office at UA and sit down in the office and talk to her, you know, that kind of thing. What COVID-19 has done, it has separate, isolated our students and put everybody behind a screen like this one so i'm talking to a screen i have no idea who i'm talking to you know when i'm in the blackboard collaborate i usually ask my students to even if you're lying in bed with some of them are doing as i said they're not them face already for the video like i said show me your face before we start so everybody says good morning and so because that kind of isolation also takes you away from the kind of networking the contact with your peers the sharing of information that you could have shared more easily and many students have issues with um technology you're not the, 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 the internet not so good some people don't have a proper 
like and tablets also. So it has impact on people a lot. And some of my students that email me, they are depressed, they are struggling, but we are trying to work through. And see how relevant is our mental health. Some of my students who are, I'm on sabbatical, but I've been talking to them in different ways. And some of them are depressed. Some people didn't get to go to work. Some of some of you first gen students, some people didn't get to go to work. The summer work that they would do to and all of that people are depressed people are stressed depression and stress people are anxious and worried and their mental health therefore becomes a, a challenge i use i mean your mental health is very important um find things that make you happy and and, and reach for those whether it's listening to music, talking to friends, um, people like myself, we have a garden and a dog, you deal with that because the isolation that COVID-19 has put people under is impacting on your mental health. It's okay to be anxious, but it's not okay to make it overwhelm you. It's okay to feel like it's sad and low because people, it's a difficult time, but it's not okay to allow it to overwhelm you. Reach out to people. Instead of you know going to scrolling to um Instagram and feeling sad that everybody's life is better than yours, any of those pictures are show back some of them. Call somebody that you can talk to. Go and have a chat with your friends on WhatsApp. You know, talk about things that are important and things that make you happy. That is something that you can do. Take a walk if you are able to take a walk. You know, take a make your family take you on a little drive out if you are able to go on like a drive out. Do things to make your mental health keep your mental health. All things get too difficult fancy for a professional. We still have our health center on campus. You can access what is available. But it's a very difficult COVID-19 has impacted on everybody. Some families have lost their income. Very hard on families, depending on the kind of work you do. Students are part of families, and this is something that will impact on them. So again, try we have to keep the focus because all of us, the whole world is under the wave of whatever COVID-19 is. Let's real are fabricated. The world is struggling with it. And we are all going to come out on the other side. I'm very sure about this. Better, better abilities, more, more are technologically savvy because we all have to learn how to use the technology. So again, focus on the positive. Keep your chin up. That is what I want to say. What advice would you give to for parents and guardian, guardians in terms of the best ways to support their first generation students? Learn as much as you can okay, about the university, learn about the structures, learn about what your children are going through. Try to learn about it. So you don't have to learn the coursework, as I mean, the coursework, some of us, you know, science and it's a different world world but listen to your children they want sometimes they come home and they want to complain let them vent and then encourage them um so try and understand what they are going through because a university especially for a first generation university student let me tell you the first degree is the hardest hurdle you're, you're going to jump it is going to it's sometimes it comes with the cosmos of true obstacle at you all kind of things jumping out of the woodwork at you so you, you have to, parents have to give their children as much support as possible. Be there for them. If you see them struggling, be there for them. If you see them distracting themselves, try to help them to refocus. Um, sometimes a little, you know, sternness or little quarrelsome is necessary. Remind them of the role that they are also playing and be there as su supportive as much as possible. That's one of the things. My mother was very supportive, even though she didn't have any money, you see? But she was extremely supportive. She made sure, I mean, I would be on home. She would try and make sure she cooked whatever was there, did a lot for me. So all of these things are very important as a part of the journey. And so parents should try to be as supportive as possible. I'm seeing Dr. Gallimore on the screen. Hi, Dr. Gallimore, yes. And so being a supportive for their students, yes. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so very much. We're having some technicalities, which was part of the challenge, but hey, that's part of what COVID-19 is teaching us all, you know, pivoting and doing the best that we can and making changes and hoping for the best, that type of thing, yes. you know, so many of the things that our students are going through in terms of with the technology, you know, we are also going through them as well. You know, you're on sabbatical, so, you know, you, you, some of the challenges that we have to be circumventing um fortunately for you um you can 
wait until the next year <laughs> and see how it goes. Well, I had to survive. All right, so remember really, I was there Professor for the Hope can Remember, I was true, there for the spring true, semester. The true, first, true, 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 true. The first run of everything. Um, first run of everything. It was like awesome. pulling teeth without cocaine. So it was. I, I know what is happening. I've been, you know, I know. It, it was very difficult, but yes, we are going along. Very, that's so so true. All righty. So, um, really, we want to really, really thank you for all that you've shared with us. You know, you shared your, your story, your absolutely compelling story. You know, um, some of us can't imagine it, can't imagine being in a situation where you are the breadwinner for your family. You know, your mother is looking to you. It's, it's something else, it must have been something else. And you're going to school at the same time, you know. The, and we're the FST students tend to come up. Amazing, absolutely amazing story. You know, we really continue to be inspired by it, and we trust that um, our students will, will learn those lessons too. You know, sometimes we have the younger, yeah, we have the relatively younger students, you know. So sci may so and arts and humanities education may have, you know, a slightly more mature set, but the fresh, fresh ones, freshest ones come through FST. And so the fact that, you know, they're coming to understand that there's so many things that other persons can do and make it through, it's, it's, it's really very, very inspiring, you know? Um, yeah. I want to speak back a little bit in terms of entrepreneurship, you know? Um, I'm gonna actually go to the quote that you, that you gave. You said, if you come from a poor family, why would you expect that a single job, a regular job, will give you enough resources to achieve your goals and dreams? That is what you said in your book. Um, and you did speak about the fact that entrepreneurship is important and that we are focusing more on it here at UWE. Do you think that there is more that we can do to, to students that the degree is very, has value, but to also recognize that there's a need to, to have a plan B, basically. Or, or a plan A, A, because, because one of the things that I talk about in Chicken Bad Gravy is the fact that I think this is the first time in my whole life at this year that I only have one job. I mean, I will, and I do a column for the Observer, which I'm not, I'm not done for a few months, but um, but I'm always doing several things. So I usually have three jobs eh, or so, because what I found out coming from a poor background, is that you have a job, but that if you have other skills, you have to transform them into resources. So I would do, I remember I used to do yes, cutting yes. Editing for people, I used to do typing for people, I used to help people, because one of the things that you find is that I, and I, I went to um, Durham College before I came to US, so I type very fast, even now, 140 words per minute, I can type very fast. So you you turn some of those skills, yes, um, into, into money. As you have, you recognize yeah. that if you want to achieve certain things, then you're going to have to use your yeah. skills. So a lot of our students, I find, I find exactly for where I am in the um, in the Institute of Caribbean Studies or by Humanities, a lot of our students are creatives. And so we have students who are in the university, but they are makeup artists, they are models, they are singers, yeah. they are producers, they are promoters. They are, so we have people who are using their other skills to provide either a service or to create goods. We have students who are selling products. Um, so you have people right. who are trans people, some people can cook, so they are making goods for sale. Um, you know, students yes. who are coming to the sciences are, are going to be working with 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 um with, 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 with um phenomena that they can transform into products. There are lots of different industries that are open up now. So I, I encourage students that to look towards, based on where your area of work is, to look towards ways that you can yeah. do additional work. I was on a radio, I hosted a radio program for several years. I was on Hot 102, then I was on New Thought 93 FM. And so, so you, you I, because I have a first year okay. and I learned how to do radio. So I mean, you can do other things that advice. So I have seen university students who are doing fashion, so they are making bathing suits and they are making outfits. I see them on Instagram yes. showcasing their way and they are doing law, yes. they are doing medicine. A lot of students are doing that now because they realize that yes. entrepreneurship is important. Mm -hmm. A lot of students who are in the room, I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity now, for example, for natural products. Like I use 
coconut oil, natural coconut oil mm -hmm. and, and, and um, castor oil, which I buy, my sister-in-law buys it in the market in Lintigas of Lady who supplies me with it. Students who are from rural areas or even Kingston, you know, you can get those products and yes. then pick them in. people will buy them. They are very popular. Um, lemongrass, there's a yes. big lemongrass industry, we call it fever grass. There's all of these things I think that students can think about, the natural yeah. products, culinary art, the fashion, the makeup, yeah, because this is the way world, I mean, you can be a medical doctor, a scientist, and you can sell um, other things on the side, or you can have another thing, because this is the way that the world is going now. That's so true. That is so true. And and the truth is as well that, you know, we do, as you spoke about in terms of, you know, makeup and all of those things, we, I do recall when we've had expos on the spine in the faculty, you know, where students, you know, we have persons with their little makeup booths and the you know, persons who do a variety of things, you know, um, crochet and that suits and stuff like that. And so jewelry, it is jewelry, true, you know, they, yes. we all jewelry, have to do the jewelry, jewelry. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. So, so yeah, it is true. You know, we have to be, be, be thinking more than one way, you know, and can be putting all our eggs basically, you know, so very much so. And I guess as lecturers too, you know, we, we have to kind of show the way type of a thing, you know, and so that's, that's going to be very important. Awesome. 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 Um, Another quotation from your book says, there are greater things in life to fear, like poverty and deprivation, and the high levels of disrespect that come with this subject position. You want oh, to share yeah. just, you know, as we are wrapping up, what were some of the, the, the things that you went through as a result of, of, having, of not having enough, of, of, of having that poverty in your life? Well, let me put it this way. Um, Jamaica, I mean, in Jamaica, we advance into something called political correctness, but we're not there yet. Um, and you'll find, if you even look on social media, you'll find that Jamaicans, um, as Jamaicans, we tend to, we, we as I, and I put in Jamaican parlance, you'll say, we take step with people, especially people who are poor, far easily. It's almost as if they are invisible. Mm -hmm. We'll say very unkind things about people. Many times, their situation is what causes them to be in that position. They don't have much choice. Because that's the situation they find. Yes. So we don't say anything about them because we understand that they can't do anything much about us. When you're poor, some people, I mean, I remember when I was attending high school, St. Diego High School, um, and we, we wore a green tunic and we had a checkered blouse. It's a checkered blouse. So the material is a very soft material. Mm -hmm. And because of the way that my family situation was very bad, the color of my blouse got, it was very frayed. So my mother would take the color off and turn it because people are poor and all the world. Right. So I remember I was in the line at the top shop one day and I'm standing in the line. And this girl tackled me about my color, you know. No, I don't have no control over the color of my uniform. My mother is doing her best. I'm wearing my free on neck color. My free on neck. Because she turned yes. the color and it's inside free. And people take steps. Let me tell you, people say things directly to your face because they know that your situation. So, you know, I had to tackle this yeah. girl. People, young people, I'm not saying about spite people, but I'm saying I had to defend my color. It's not my fault that my color is free, but that my poor mother is doing her best. And that the government scholarship at that time was absolutely nothing. It was $40, a check for $40, which paid the $35 caution fee at St. Diego, which was like the school fee. So, you know, it didn't, so it, we didn't get books, we didn't get anything with it. Not like now we actually get money that can do something. And so I was very, yeah. I, what I did, I was very adversarial because of some of these things. I learned, I was very defensive about a lot of things because people go out of their way to tackle you. And so we do it all the time in Jamaica. You're walking by like somebody looking a little wee and people. And students on campus come to me and they'll complain that they are, you know, other students are not sharing stuff with them or other students are not, you know, being be involved in them because maybe they don't have on the right clothes or the hair don't look right. Thing, you know? mm -hmm. Focus on your degree and you and also find your group. One of the things you'll find, find your group. Yeah, yeah. People will fall out of the sky. They will come up out of the woodwork just to take step with you because of your situation you have to rise above your situation and leave that behind one thing that i did i yeah. left all those things behind but from this angle where i'm sitting 
I understand the ways that people can harm other people with their words. Just the words, you know. They say sticks and stones will break my bone, but names can never hurt me. I don't know about that part of it. People have very harmful words and phrases in their mouth that they use against other people. And in Jamaica, we're still learning political correctness. We're not there fully, we're getting there. But our young people are coming from situations where they are working through these things. Brave up yourself. Um, you are young adults, yes. you are coming to brave up yourself and, and just work and get your, your, your degree and move on to the next level. And, and again, put on your blinkers, don't be distracted by the shine and glisten and pretty pretty that is out there. You are going on your yes. own journey and you're heading, and you're heading there in your own way. But, uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Awesome, 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 awesome. Thank you so, so very much. This has been a really inspiring uh, session and inspiring evening, you know, and um, I trust that our students will will really take on the things that you've you've shared and they will recognize that if somebody else has done it and made it through with all of the challenges that you faced on the journey, that they can do it too. You know, um, yes, okay, you let me know that you, you know, can do it. Their unique challenges. Yes, you can do it. I think I have it in the book. You can do it. You can always do it. You can always do it. Just believe and set your goals and remember, no. Let me say again, hard work don't kill anybody. You have to be willing to work hard, but also willing to work smart. It's two kinds of work. Working hard, but also working smart. Working hard, you know, you put in the hard work. Or working awesome. smart, you structure awesome. awesome. your life and you put in what you need to put in. Build your networks, um, plan ahead, make sure you, and, and you will you will get there. Believe me, you will. Awesome, 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 awesome. Okay, excellent. So, um, our 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 hour is work already. You know, and um, we really, as I said it before, really want to thank you for taking the time out of your sabbatical. We know that sabbatical and it's precious time. And yes, you know, you're kind of grounded with COVID-19, but I am sure it's, it's, it's whatever advantages are to be accrued as a result of that. If anybody is going to find those advantages and use them, it will be you. So thank you so, so very much. And students, be inspired and take a decision that you are well able to do all that needs to be done in order to get the degree that you've, you came here for. As my associate dean in um, undergrad matters says, you know, no one is giving you a certificate of participation coming here to you, right? You're not going to be getting a certificate of participation. You have to finish your course. What you start, Take that decision as you're going to finish it and run the race and you will make it through all right so um thank you again professor hope and we wish you all the best in all of your endeavors um you you had spoken about all of your entrepreneur not only entrepreneurial your philanthropic work and i find it absolutely amazing and bless you bless you bless you because you know, some persons will come out of the situation and having come out of the situation, you know, they don't remember where they're coming from. But the fact that you, you're interacting and you're still in the lives of people and the mere fact that you agreed to do this, um, this, this evening, you know, it, it speaks volumes to, and your, your care and your love for the students just shone through in everything that you said this evening. And so we just want to bless you and thank you for your, um, all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do wish you all the best in all of the books that you say you're writing and the second volume i look forward to my second volume of, of chicken, uh, back gravy. chicken back gravy and such delights so that's part part two is what it's going to be it's going to be um this is chicken back gravy. it's going to be a second serving i think it will be a second <laughs> serving and then we have one called the, the, the dessert i think that's what it is so the guys are working on the title but thank you so much, Anna. Awesome. 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 And big up all the students and big up everyone who is a part of this. And thank you guys for having me. It's always, always for my students. I tell them, my students, whichever faculty, always for the students. And it's always for the students. They, they are the ones who make me who I am. And I'm always grateful. Thank you. 
Awesome, 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 awesome. Bless you, bless you, bless you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving the studio now. And so we just want to thank you for watching. And I, will, I know that many of you will watch it hereafter. And so um, blessings, blessings, blessings and abundance. All right, you take care now. Bye.